my name is Cheryl Weir, and my position is the manager of the Health Disparities Reduction and Minority Health Section, which is a mouthful. Um, essentially, the work that we do is to keep a continuing focus on health disparities and health inequities as they affect populations of color. What we do know is that racial and ethnic minority populations and the ones we serve specifically are African American, Asian American Pacific Islander, Native Americans, Hispanic Latino, and what is unique to Michigan is that one of the racial ethnic populations that we serve is Arab and Chaldean Americans. Um, Michigan is home to, I think, the largest Arab and Chaldean population outside of the Middle East. And so we have a significant part of our population who has invested in the state, are invested in the state, and um, we want to make sure that we're looking at the health disparities and health inequities as they impact those populations as well. So that's what our section does, and we do it through a number of ways. We focus in five primary areas in terms of the work we do. We try to improve data and the availability of data and access to data on racial and ethnic populations. We do know that one of the reasons why or one of the problems with developing programs and interventions is that the data aren't always uh, available, um, particularly if you look at populations like uh, Native Americans, Hispanic, um, and Asian Americans in this state. Um, we never even capture enough uh, responses in our annual behavior risk factor survey which is a statewide survey done every year in every state across the nation. And for Michigan, um, we don't capture enough of those responses to, to know what's going on with those populations. And so we've done some things in order to um, impact uh, the availability of data. So that's one of the things that we really focus on in our section. The other thing we focus on is raising awareness and education among not just professionals, but among communities um, about health disparities and the causes, the root causes of health inequities for racial and ethnic populations. To start to understand that behavior is one thing, but the systems really drive uh, the conditions, the social determinants that then sometimes impact behavior. So oftentimes we talk about behavior as this sort of isolated thing. If we could just get people to change. Um, people can't change if their choices are limited based on the, 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 the neighborhood, the access, the social determinants that they're living with every day. So we really want to raise awareness about these issues. The other thing we do is work with communities to build internal capacity. We do understand that communities are able to make a difference. They know. They may not call it the public health terms that we use or the medical terminology, but folks know that things are going on in their in their communities that need to be changed. But they also know uh, what the assets of their communities are. And so if, if you work better with communities and help them build capacity where they think they need it built in order to address these, that is a really good thing. And so that's one of the areas we work in. The other is we work to build partnerships. Um, capacity is one thing, but authentic partnerships is quite another. And there's a couple ways in which we've tried to do that out of this section. Um, one is that as we're doing these, these data surveys and behavior risk factor surveys that we do, um, we make sure to have an advisory group that is either people from the community or people who work with the community to help us determine how the survey is going to go, what questions we're going to ask, how do we analyze the data, and then how do we disseminate the data back to the community. So partnerships, authentic partnerships are very important. And then lastly, what we do is really try to work on improving access to quality health care. Um, we know that's a huge thing. If you look at the surveys that we do from year to year, the populations who always report having less access are Hispanics, African Americans, pretty consistently. So those are the things that we have chosen to focus our efforts on. Um, we're a small section. We are about six employees, and so um, and we try to do big work with small with a small section. So you spoke on data. How do you go about um, targeting communities that are most in need? Um, in terms of um, social uh, determinants, how do you target those communities that have uh, less uh, equity? So one of the things that we do, um, I'll, I'll go back to, to data because without good data you don't know who needs to be targeted. Um, there are other programs in our department, and again, I'm not totally speaking for them. I'm saying how we work with them and the work that we do. We target based on the data we're able to collect 
based on what we hear from communities. Um, so what we try to do is, one thing that we did that uh, I thought was really interesting, I have an epidemiologist and, and they're really good at ha having me think about how we might creatively either collect data, analyze data, present data. And we have been doing behavior risk factor surveys for a while um, and, and, and trying to find out what the health trends were for Asian Americans in the state. And here, like almost everywhere else, um, other than places where you have a really heavy Asian American population, maybe California, New York, the same results come through, saying Asian Americans traditionally are healthier. Um, they're, they're not um, accessing the healthcare system in the same way, but they're healthier, they're higher educated. But we wanted to find out if that was really true across populations. The thing about Asian Americans, when you say Asian Americans, you could be talking about 15 subpopulations. And so unless you have a way to identify what's happening within the subpopulations, you just keep saying that Asian Americans tend to be healthier, right? So what happened with my uh, epidemiologist is uh, she said, you know, there's, there's a methodology that I found that was done in Minnesota. And what we can do is examine birth certificate data um, and if we and, and examine by race and then we could look at what the maternal indicators were for those subpopulations. So we did an analysis where we identified across about 15 subpopulations. So Vietnamese, Cambodian, um, Asian Indian, Chinese, Japanese, Hmong, Karen, I, I, I don't have everybody, Bangladeshi, um, that are in the state. <clears throat> and when we did that, we were able to determine that maternal indicators such as mater mother's education, access to prenatal care, um, um, other indicators that tell you whether or not a healthy birth outcome or what were the conditions for those moms prior to, to delivery, we found there was really there were disparities across those groups where we would not have known that had we just looked at the data that are regularly collected going deeper and so when you ask me how do we identify these populations you have to be willing to go deeper you have to be willing to find other ways to collect data to analyze data to work with communities so you really know what's going on because otherwise you're just looking at a big data set and so what we found was that Bangladeshi um, Hmong moms um, other other moms were having much wor worse maternal health indicators than your Chinese American moms, your Japanese American moms, your Asian Indian moms. So what that says is, when we get ready to develop these programs for these populations, we need to say, wait a minute, there's a subpopulation that we probably should be targeting to. And so it helps not just us, but it helps people in communities decide, hey, we ought to be targeting to these moms because their indicators are worse. And so that's one of the ways in which we, we try to accomplish that. In terms of um, income and um, other factors such as uh, the children in unsafe communities um, and high mortality rates and things like that. How does your uh, bureau or your department um, go about targeting those those factors and um, addressing the needs of ensuring healthier communities in, in the, those regards? So, so the interesting thing to me, and I have to reflect on this a little bit as you ask me this question because my first re rea reaction or response would be um, Michigan Department of Health and Human Services cannot do this work in isolation. If we talk about social determinants then what we're talking about is are those systems and factors that are that are putting minority children at risk for living in unsafe neighborhoods, unsafe housing, um, unstable housing. I mean you can you can look at the numbers across the board and one, one fact that has always been interesting to me is that if, you, if, a, if a poor child um, is raised in a, a resource poor community, then the chances of them generationally being poor, getting out of poverty, um, are substantially higher, right? Um, so when you look at Hispanic and black kids, their chance of living in a poor Hispanic and black kids their chance of living in a resource poor neighborhood are significantly higher than a poor white child. 
So if I'm a poor white child, um, my chances are like 30%, I think it is, that I will be in a resource poor neighborhood, which says, even though I'm poor, I have access to better education, I have access to health care, I have access to recreation and parks, I have access to those things that support me even though I'm poor. Whereas for Hispanic and black kids, their chances are so low that they're going to have those resources. So what does that lead to? You're talking about not having places to recreate. You're talking about uh, convenience stores versus grocery stores. You're talking about eating habits. You're talking about not being able to go out and walk um, to, to, or out to play. So where it impacts obesity, those kinds of things. So again, when we talk about this, so it's more than health and human services. It's education, it's parks and rec, it's, it's all of those other folks that unless we understand this broader concept of systems and social determinants, then we will just be putting band-aids. So for us, I think one of the things that is pretty interesting in this department is that three years ago we were the Department of Community Health and there was a Department of Human Services. And we rarely, I think, interfaced. Um, and, and we were merged about three years ago. And you can imagine it was major because we had, I think, the Department of Community Health might have been 2,300 strong or something like that. And human services was much bigger. And so you're merging two cultures. Um, but I'm really encouraged because what it has given us an opportunity to do is say, well, here are multiple determinants that we can impact. Human services, services to children, and those kinds of things connect those to health services. And we can have a bigger impact on addressing the social determinants um, by being one department. Now, we have to work together. And, and I'm, I'm so pleased to say there have been some interesting collaborations in this department around issues of racial justice, social justice, and how do we use what we have and what we know and our resources together to really try to improve the life experience for our most vulnerable uh, populations, children, obviously, people of color. Um, and so I, I, I'm really encouraged uh, that, that we can make a difference and then start to pull in some of the others like Department of Ed, civil rights, those folks. And we've started to have some conversations with them saying that this, this whole notion of social justice and racial justice and equity, we all have to buy into this. We all have to understand that it doesn't just affect those populations of color because if it's affecting populations of color, as populations of color increase across this country and in this state, it affects everybody. And so that's how uh, we've chosen to try to, to try to address these things. In terms of dialogue with the community, people in the community, how do you have those conversations with uh, helping them to understand um, what the issues are or even getting their input on what the issues are and how you meet them at their level to facilitate uh, better health outcomes? There are, there are multiple things that are going on in the department. Oftentimes when you're doing community planning, public health planning, there are requirements that you reach out to communities and have dialogue with them. And so that does go on. For our specific uh, section, what we have done um, um, in 2010, we wanted to develop some kind of a road map that talked about uh, what are the major recommendations for what needs to be done to improve racial and ethnic health equity in this state. And so we decided to go out and work with community agencies that are representing the five populations that we serve um, and, and set up these community dialogues to ask the public, what is the most important? If you could be healthy, if your community could be healthy, what are the most important things that have to happen in order for, and what can we assist you with in order to make that happen? And that happened in 2010. And what came out of that was what we call the Health Disparities Roadmap. Um, the, health, the health equity roadmap, excuse me, which, which includes five key recommendations, not just for state, for, for community-based organizations, for um, um, educators, for other folks, law enforcement. What are the five key areas that we can impact if we're going to help communities be healthier? And that's the five categories that I mentioned to you at the beginning. That's how we do our work. Because what we heard from community was we need better access to health care, we need people to understand better what's going on. We need better data so we can understand. We need authentic partnerships. And um, 
again, like I said, we need access to care. And so that's what drives our work. Um, we're currently trying to redo that process and find funding for that because it's been about seven or eight years. So it's really, really important that we do interact with community in that way. Um, one other thing that I'd like to say is in Michigan, we have what's called Public Act 653, which we call the Minority Health Law. And in 2007, um, our legislators um, mandated this department to keep a continuing focus and develop a structure that will work to eliminate health disparities for racial and ethnic minority populations. And that is what drives our work and drives the, the, the department's work as it relates to health um, and minority populations. And so there are um, lots of reasons and lots of uh, things that, that sort of direct us in terms of the work that we do, but none obviously more important than making sure that our communities are engaged with us and that we hear from them and that not only we hear from them, but we respond to what we hear. Um, and so I will say this, that one of the efforts that is that came out of this as well, the work I talked about that happened with the roadmap, is that we decided that our funding, and we don't get a lot of money to do grant funding, but we wanted to make sure that the money we got was directed in a way that addressed what communities told us they wanted. And so we developed what we call the capacity building program, which really is our approach to working with communities. What we typically do is issue a request for proposal and we say to communities across the state, representing the five racial ethnic populations, um, we want you to send us a, a proposal. And the proposal should tell us a couple of things. It's a planning proposal. We will fund the first year of planning. Um, what you need to, what we require is that you um, develop or enhance a current community partnership that you have going on. Right? So you involve various sectors in this effort. Number two, we want you to do some kind of assessment of what's happening in your community. And that could be looking at data, talking to folks, whatever. Um, and then um, from that, we want you to develop a proposal that says, this is what our community said were their social determinants. These are the things that they said we need to deal with. They submit that back to us. And we oftentimes are not able to fund everybody, but we pull from what we can and we fund people for two or more years beyond that to actually do implementation and evaluation. Um, again, because it's the community decides, most, most grant proposals I'd send out and say, you know what, I want you to do something around cardiovascular disease, right? And send me back a proposal that tells me what you're gonna do about cardiovascular or obesity or whatever. We don't do that. We say, tell me what you're going to do to address a social determinant, one or more, that your community has identified as something that's impeding them from being healthy. And so our first capacity building grant program, we got some really interesting proposals. And we funded some really interesting proposals. One of the proposals we funded was for a, 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 a community um, group who was sponsored by a health system. Um, it was the community investment arm um, to work in a particular northeast Detroit community um, to improve the environment for safety. They said that the reason we're not walking or the reason we don't feel comfortable is because it's not safe. And now most people will say, well, what does that have to do? How can, you, how can you fund safety and translate that to public health? So what they asked to do was they wanted to beef up their van patrol they wanted to do blight removal. They wanted to get the community engaged. Um, and so they did that work and actually documented crime statistics because they had a partnership. They had the police there, they had other folks, and they actually documented a decrease in crime in that community by that effort. Right Now, most people in health are like, okay, but is that directly related? No, it's not, but it's socially determined. I mean, if you're talking upstream, you can't talk about making people well unless you're talking about making their communities well. Um, we had another one in Inkster where they said, well, our issue is around access to healthy and, and safe and good food. And what we want to do is work with the schools to develop community gardens at the school sites. Um, they also work with the food pantries to 
have them offer healthier food. They work with the restaurants to sort of change their menus to make them healthier. And they built this tremendous, tremendous coalition in that community. The mayor actually sat on that coalition because they wanted to make a difference in terms of access to healthy foods in their community. And they did some phenomenal work. And in fact, that coalition still continues to this day. And that was six years ago. So we had some very interesting approaches based on the community and what folks needed. In, in um, Oceana County up in northern part of, uh, up in north in Michigan, um, they decided that they had uh, Asian Americans um, and American Indians who were coming into the hospital system, but there was no real cultural competence, there was no health literacy assistance, so folks weren't understanding what their orders were, nobody was really working with them, um, and so we funded them to work with the hospital to do some, some translation of information, to have community health workers work with folks as they were getting discharged, to make sure people understood their plans, and to improve their ability to follow through and follow up. Every community, whether it was Detroit or North in Michigan or West in Michigan, had a unique approach. But that was based on what their communities told them was one of the major barriers to them being able to be healthy. That's what we wanted to fund. That's what capacity building is all about. The community has the idea. How can we partner with them? How can we help them? Another key component of that is that everybody who got funded had to go through training. And we train on health equity, social justice, the key foundations, community engagement. How do you make this successful? But how do you understand what these underlying causes are? So as you try to um, uh, impact, you're understanding what the root causes are. And you're helping your community understand what the root causes are. So that's our capacity building program model that, that we develop. And evaluation all the way, okay. always evaluation. At the very basic level, let's say I live in a community um, and I feel as though there's issues um, that are specific to where I live um, that determines health factors, uh, health outcomes in that community. How do I begin advocating for resource allocation um, to get my community healthier? With us? Yes. Or the Department of Health? Well, I would say maybe I'll broaden that to state government in general. How do I, as a citizen, yes, yes. make my impact or attempt to? I think there's a number of ways. Um, probably the most obvious way is that you have legislators and representatives who represent you, right? And one of the ways is to get in touch with them and say, these are the issues that I think are happening. Or make sure you show up at their town halls. Make sure you show up at their office. Because I think one of the most direct ways is to work with your representatives because that is their job. The other thing is to educate yourself on the issues. So when you do go to that legislator, uh, you can be educated on issues. You can tell them what you know and what you see and what you've read and what's real. Um, the other thing is, as people say, make sure that you're able to tell your story. And so I would say that's one real way is to work with and through your, the people that represent you. But the other thing is that there are lots of community organizations who are doing this work. And I think they're always looking for people who can help extend the work that they do. And I would suggest that people find organizations, even as a block club, where you can start to have these discussions and folks can start to educate themselves and then folks can start to impact the system in that, in that way. Um, so that would be my thing, but you know, they can call our office. They can have a conversation with us. They can find out what we're funding for. They can find out some information that we have. We have a website, and uh, people can go to that website and, and, and get information. But I would say, I think it's really important that people realize that the work they can do can be very local. And so people don't shy away saying, you know, I can't go up to Lansing and sit in on a hearing. No, you don't have to do that. Make it very local very personal, and I, th I think there are lots of ways in which you can impact it. Yes. Great. Um, the reason why I asked that question, even in speaking to my Lyft driver on my way here, mm. um, there is a big divide. It's them versus us, government versus the people. And that's their perception, or our perception, I mm -hmm. should say, because mm -hmm. I'm not government, mm -hmm. um, in regards to what is available 
and what government does for them. Mm -hmm. So can you speak on how access to resources or federal funding affect um, state and city government's ability mm -hmm. to fund programs so that these communities can be healthier? Well, I would say, I mean, I'm, I'm speaking from what, I, what I've experienced at the State Health Department, um, a, a significant amount of our funding is federal, significant amount. Um, some programs more than others, but so a reduction in funding definitely means a reduction in the folks we can serve. Goes without saying. Um, but our mission at this department is to really work with the popula populations that are the most vulnerable. So as funding shrinks, we, we have to target and focus our, our resources much more and much better. Um, in terms of the populations who need us the most. So federal funding is critical. I, I don't know what else to say. It's critical um, in terms of the work that we can do and how we can expand our work.